Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Derek Terrell, and I'm the Director of Member Engagement with the Coalition for College. I'm joined today by four amazing admissions counselors from across the nation to talk with you about special campus visit opportunities that are often referred to as fly-ins. And as the title states, they will share with you what you need to know about these fly-in programs more broadly. Uh, following the opening panel, there will be three 40-minute college fair sessions. You'll be able to hear from and connect with 40 member schools who offer fly-in programs each year and find out more about their schools, uh, the fly-in programs, and any changes that might be occurring uh, this year in particular. So let's get started with a round of introductions from our panelists, and we'll go ahead and go in alphabetical order by institution. <laughs> Hello everyone, I hope you are well wherever you are viewing us right now. My name is Nicole Molina and I am the Associate Director and Director of Diversity Recruitment and Outreach at Barnard College in New York, New York. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Very excited to be here with you all today. I am Yaneli Ruiz, a proud first generation college graduate and currently serving as the Assistant Dean of Admissions at Claremont McKenna College, a member of the Claremont Colleges located in Claremont, California. Hi hey everyone, so nice to see you all here. My name is Alia Georges. I use she and her pronouns and I'm the Assistant Director of Admission and also the Financial Aid Counselor at Olin College of Engineering in Needham, Massachusetts. Well, good afternoon everyone. My name is Tony Moore. I'm Director of Multicultural Outreach at uh, the Pennsylvania State University, Penn State. All right, awesome, thank you. And we will go ahead and dive into some of the questions. Uh, so the first question that we have today uh, is what are flying programs and why do schools offer them? And I, I think that's me uh, that, that, that uh, starts with that, that question. So uh, again, and, and why do um, universities, I, I'll actually start with the second part of that question about why do universities offer flying programs? And it's about access and affordability, first of all. It's, it's about the opportunity to give students who are further afield the opportunity to get to, universe, uh, to colleges and universities uh, that are not within their driving distances. And so, um, again, and we talked about fly-ins, but there are also bus trip opportunities as well. And um, depending on the institutions, they may even allow for even greater opportunity for a greater number of students to, to be a part of that. As well, and so um, why do universities provide these opportunities? Because we want to make sure uh, that students have options uh, when they're looking for colleges and universities across the country. And there are so many different types of institutions, a lot more than that that are just in your respective backyards. Again, there are uh, public institutions, there are private institutions. Uh, just on this panel alone, uh, there are state institutions, um, there are large institutions, small institutions. Again, and I, I think students need to uh, sort of experience the large wealth of opportunities out there and different types of institutions to help them make that more informed decision about what's the best fit for them. So I, um, I would always say keep your options open as, and make them as broad initially and start to narrow them down as you start to uh, visit those institutions that uh, you start to really focus in on. And uh, again, you don't want to limit yourself to just the one uh, institutions that are in your backyard. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, the next question. So aside from this coalition college fair, how can students find out more about these types of visit programs? Thank you for posing that question, Derek. So I'd like to begin by, by sharing that as it, in this moment, admission offices are in a state of flux. The country is in a state of flux amid, amidst this pandemic. Um, so we want to be very transparent with you all. The first note I would add to that is, is we are asking for your patience. Historically, uh, flying programs, bus programs have taken place at the institutions, right? You, we, we are very privileged and in a privileged position to be able to offer these programs, very happy to do so. Um, but as things stand and knowing that your health, your safety, the safety of our community members is of utmost importance. We ask for your patience as um, my colleagues, institutions across the, the nation are weighing their options, are considering all elements, all components and determining um, what, how they will um, present these opportunities to you all this fall. 
many institutions are transitioning to a virtual program and are, are truly working diligently with their teams to ensure that they are providing as, as best of an experience as they can uh, this fall with the hope that maybe some have the hope that they may be able to, you know, bring you out to campuses perhaps in the spring if it is safe to do so at this time. So I ask for your patience first and foremost, but I would like to finish on this note, empowering you all to approach each um, in your research process, which we'll talk about in just a minute as well, um, for you to do your research. And a great way to do so is by actually signing up for mailing lists in colleges that you're interested in, um, or also attending information sessions. We, the, the admission officers, are finding out information sometimes on the daily. And the best platform we can use um, oftentimes to share that information out besides on our actual websites is through virtual information sessions. So I would like to empower you all to register for these information sessions, connect with direct admission officers at these institutions because they can provide you with the most up-to-date information. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, the next question that I have is what do students need or how should they prepare to apply for a fly-in program? Thank you. I can take that one. So um, I think when it comes to preparing for fly-ins, the first thing is really like Yanelli just said, um, taking the time to learn about those institutions. Um, maybe you are already interested in them or maybe someone else has said, hey, you really should take a look at this particular college. Um, especially now when there are so many opportunities right from home that you can sit in on presentations, um, meet with students from that school. It's good just to start with that kind of research so you know if you're even interested in that college because if you know in your heart that there's a certain major you definitely want to do or there are certain things that you must have in a college experience, you wanna find out if that college offers it before you go through the process of applying and visiting um, and whatnot. So that's I think the first step and then when you actually decide, yes, this is a college I, I want to learn more about. It doesn't have to mean you know you want to go there. That's part of the point of this is that you can go and try it on. Um, but if something about that college, you know, strikes your interest, when it comes to applying, different colleges are going to require different things for their fly-ins. Um, so some of them are going to require materials like a copy of your transcript, uh, maybe an essay about why you want to attend that fly-in program. They may ask for recommendation letters from one or more of your teachers, um, or maybe documentation showing that you meet the requirements of that program. Maybe they have, um, you know, like a financial or an income requirement. Um, so they may ask for some paperwork related to that. So it's important to start early with that because you want to know what they're asking you for and give yourself enough time to do that. And that also means giving other people enough time to help you with that. So if you need your teacher or your parent or your counselor to send any paperwork, um, it's not just a courtesy to them to give them time to do that. It, it certainly is, but it also means that they'll be more likely to have the time to do that and to do it well. So it's in your interest as well. Um, and as you're approaching all this, I think it's really good practice just for the college application process itself because a lot of the processes and materials are going to be similar. So this is a great chance to, um, you know, practice working on those types of materials, balancing deadlines, communicating with people in your life. Um, so it has a benefit outside of just whether or not you get accepted to that particular fly-in. Um, and the last thing I'll say about this is to know that um, some of these requirements may be in flux this year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So some application requirements may look different this year from past year. So for example, some schools who normally require that you send test scores as part of a fly-in application, maybe they don't have that requirement this year. Um, so if you're applying this year, you know, you want to look at that, but also be aware that, you know, that doesn't necessarily apply to future years. So just checking those um, requirements. And we also understand that some of your materials may look different. So maybe you had uh, pass fail classes on your transcript from the spring because maybe your school wasn't doing traditional letter grades. 
that's okay. We're aware that a lot of people are in that situation. But if you're concerned about something like that, just ask, just talk to us about that. Thank you so much, Aliyah. So um, as I mentioned, we have 40 member schools here today who are uh, talking about their fly-in and their visit programs. Um, but the next question is for Nicole. So to how many fly-in visit programs should a student apply? Now, I'm sure all of you are like, okay, we're in a pandemic, everything is online, I'm going to sign up for everything. No, don't do that. Um, and to be honest, you know, without the physical being on the campus, and you know, you're going to hear it from me first, a lot of us will look and feel the same in this virtual space. So there has to be on your end, students, a discernment of your fit, you know, thinking of the philosophy of the colleges, and universities in which you're thinking about, maybe haven't really heard about, but you're doing your research and you feel inclined, those should be the colleges, if you will, and universities that you are a little more intent on doing the research on. And if in that, they kind of pass your fit scale of what you like and what you don't like and what you can kind of negotiate with in some ways of your fit there, those would be the schools that I would say, yes, try for their fly-in. To be honest, I don't want to give a number because many of you are going to very different kinds of high schools in which there is a little more time versus not. But remember that these fly-ins are time commitment. So if you are going to be away from class for about three, four days continuously because you're going to all of these fly-ins, I can tell you right now, we as colleges, we're not going to want to see that, particularly if you're a senior and you're getting ready to kind of move forward. What I would say is don't overload the experience just because you get an invitation. Use your discernment of, does this college kind of fit what I'm looking for? Yes. Is this a college that I have a lot of information, but I want to have a little bit more of that one-on-one -on -one experience? That would be a good, yes. Okay, great. Or I just want to say that I kind of went there, but not really. I wouldn't do it. Don't, don't even worry about putting it on TikTok. Just, it's okay. Don't, don't even, you know, concern yourself with that. But it's really more so being able to flesh out the schools that kind of are feeling similar by having that one-on-one -on -one experience. And for some of you, that may be just three or four. Like, you're just really deciphering which ones you want to do because you also have to think of if you're venturing at a fly into a school that you're interested in, what's going to happen later on? Are you still going to commit? So, I'm not going to give a certified number, but don't be going to all of that. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so the next question I have is for Yaneli. Um, so if a student applies to a fly-in program and is not accepted, should they still consider applying for first-year admission to that school? If you are still interested, if you were interested in the beginning, let me start that way. Our our genuine hope is that a, a deny letter in that moment for a flying program does not dissuade you, does not discourage you from continuing first and foremost to remain engaged with the admission office um, and, and continue to stay informed because again, speaking to what Nicole shared, um, really doing your research, understanding what the best college fit for you is, is critical. And you have to make that decision for yourself, right? If you see yourself at that institution, then by all means, if there are re resources, experiences that speak to you, please do not let that discourage you. I, I will share our institution as an example. I myself was a, a participant in at Claremont McKenna's own fly-in program years ago now. <laughs> and now I have the privilege of leading this program. And I wish that, first and foremost, I wish that we could offer more than one program in the fall. Secondly, I wish that when we did offer, even that when we you know, used to have our in-person program, that we could have 50, 60, 100, 150 students coming in. But being realistic and transparent, some institutions don't have the ability to um, bring in as many students as they would like to. They have limitations. And so I wanted to share that. I think it's important for you to know that you receiving that notification, you know, if this happens this fall, it is not the end all. 
okay, of, of your college process. We don't want you, the worst thing you could do is start making assumptions. Don't think we don't love you. Again, you are welcome to reach out. And this is a note that I meant to share earlier too, is you don't just have to attend information sessions. You can email your direct regional officer right you can take that step to reach out and and ask maybe for guidance as to what you could continue to do the last thing you want to do is to just disengage if you knew in your heart and you know at that moment in time that there was a reason why you applied to that opportunity in the first place because again you never know if you apply and if you are admitted you could possibly be flown in for a spring flying opportunity or a virtual uh, spring opportunity. So my mother always said, never be afraid to ask, right? Never be afraid to follow up because the worst thing that you could do is have all those feelings lingering inside and, and asking yourself, what if? Okay. Can I just give 30 seconds to that question too? Because sure. again, in, in the manner that we do our bus trips is, um, you know, we kind of overbook. And so we only have so many spots um, and we, we invite more people than we have spots. And what we've run into so, so often is that student who wants to come after those 200 spots are filled. They're 201. So again, when you get that invitation and if you think it's something that you want to be a part of, act quickly because there are so many students who are gonna jump at that opportunity before you do. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, so we also do have um, some community-based organization counselors and, and, and high school counselors who are joining us for this webinar today. Um, so the next question is, do you have any advice on how community-based organization counselors or high school counselors uh, can help their students when it comes to uh, applying or to finding out more about these types of programs? So that's a great question and I'm excited about it because I actually had the opportunity to start my career working with a um, college access and success community based organization. So a few things I'd say about that having been on kind of both sides of it working with the students applying for these programs and now working with the program for college itself. Um, the first thing I would say is to just start by kind of cultivating relationships with these colleges so that you're familiar with the school, you're aware of the different fly-in opportunities they may offer, and you have a sense of what kind of students may be right for these schools. Um, I mean, there's over 40, um, you know, amazing coalition schools represented at this event that have a clear, uh, you know, passion for um, affordability and access. That's a great place to start of how can you be building relationships with these colleges. Um, after that, I would say pay attention to the program eligibility requirements. So those are going to vary a lot by the institution, by their uh, particular institutional goals. So some of these programs may be based on race and ethnicity. Some of them may be based on um, socioeconomic status or um, first generation status or gender identity. There's a whole range of different um, criteria that could apply. So just making sure that the student that you're um, encouraging to apply for a particular program that it actually may be um, the right fit for them. Um, and then another thing I'd say is have older students who may have gone on these client opportunities present or share information with the younger students because they can really, um, you know, kind of talk about what to expect and what might have been valuable about that to really influence their peers to seek out these opportunities. Um, and I'd also say just talk through the details with the student, kind of what to expect when it comes to things like travel. If that student hasn't maybe flown on an airplane before, we as the colleges try to be really cognizant of that and provide as much detail and information as possible, but just kind of walking through that with them um, and making sure they feel ready and comfortable. And then that also applies to maybe their parent or um, guardian as well. So if their parent or guardian has concerns about the distance or the travel or the school that they're looking at, it's better to be aware of that now and be proactive about it because if that's becoming a challenge in the student going to a fly-in at that school, it's absolutely going to be a challenge um, in terms of the student deciding to go to a school that might be a great fit for them. So starting those conversations with just not only the student but also their family um, can be really great. And then the last thing I'll say is we also understand that things are really weird right now and there may be some delays in things like transcripts 
um, and materials we're asking you for. So um, we're all just trying to be patient with each other and, and communicate as best we can, but we are aware of that. Awesome, thank you. So we have just about seven minutes and two more questions that I wanted to get, get through, so I'll go ahead with those. Um, so what would you suggest for younger students uh, to do now that might help them when it comes time to apply for a fly-in or a bus-in program? Oh, I think you might be on mute, Tony. There you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> and um, I will share just what um, was just shared in terms of uh, older siblings. You know, uh, as as if you have any older siblings or older friends who have, who have gone on trips or if they're doing a tour of colleges, um, you know, take the opportunity uh, to tag along. And, you know, I, some of the vet, best contact I've had with students, uh, both personal and and or group sessions is that, that, that younger sibling who seems so bored at first because they're just being you know, drug along to their, their brother or sister's uh, programming, but they learn so much more from that. So def definitely I uh, would advise you know, talking to your older siblings. As well, um, I would say go to websites uh, for the respective college, uh, colleges that you're looking at. Uh, many of them will have, uh, for younger students, you know, in terms of, you know, those elementary, uh, those middle elementary to uh, middle school student uh, sort of uh, sites where that will guide them and give them direction. And also, um, you know, we we'll talk about what courses to take. I know uh, we have basically a site will, that will say, okay, ninth grade, this is what you should take. Tenth grade, you know, start visiting colleges. So we'll have a step-by-step -step plan to help students uh, gear up for college as well. And uh, the other thing I would say too is a lot of schools uh, will have uh, partnerships or uh, such with middle schools. I know we have a couple of partnerships with some middle schools um, in some of our larger cities here. So if, you're, if you have that opportunity, um, again, we, uh, part of the partnerships that we do is we will provide, again, bus transportation uh, to some of our local campuses, interaction with faculty and staff as well. So if you're uh, you know, able to have those partnerships in your respective schools, uh, that would also be something great that I would uh, share to look for. Awesome, great. And then our last question will be for you, Nicole. Um, do you have any advice now for our current rising seniors as they are researching and applying to these programs for this upcoming fall? Take a deep breath. <laughs> I say that and I start with that because for all of you that are with us right now, you are on the right track. Like this is part of the research that you are doing as you should be going forward. But do not make it seem that you are trying to drink water from a rushing fire hose because it will tend to feel that way as you are consuming all of this information. I think as you are planning, time management is also a good kind of practice as we can do notifying yourself on which deadlines you need to be aware of. Yes, we're in this weird space, but our deadlines are not going to change drastically. So as part of your research, if you are not familiar with the calendar, your Google calendar, your Excel spreadsheets, your Google Sheets, those are the places that you should start putting information down to decipher how you navigate this process, not only just for fly-ins, but the application itself to the colleges and universities in which you are interested in. And at times you may feel that you don't have control. You do. There's a lot of us. We're here to help. It's just when we say the research, it's tailoring the question so that you get the answer that will best be suited to the question that you are actually answering, right? Like, so we want to make sure that we're able to provide the best information, but you got to give us a little bit. But ultimately, just take a deep breath. We are here to support you. If it's not just your counseling uh, folks and the teachers that you work with, it is also the admission staff at the institutions in which you're researching. Okay, awesome. And then I'll just pose, are there any other uh, last words of advice that any of you all have for our students or our counselors that are on the webinar today? I have a couple. Uh, I'll, I'll hopefully take less than 30 seconds. Uh, I think, again, when, when you're on this bus trip or a fly-in, take advantage of it. Just don't be there in, in, in a sense. So I always tell students, network. You know, you want to network with, the, with the, your peers who are coming in as well, you know, same age as you. You want to network with current students to talk about, again, courses, uh, things like that. You want to uh, network with faculty and staff because, uh, again, that can lead to internships, uh, co-op opportunities, um, research opportunities. And again, I would say about, you know, in terms of the importance of networking, 
is half the scholarship dollars that, that I have access to to extend out is because of those students who have networked and who had made that, you know, made that attempt to reach out and really make themselves known. Um, I would just say before you actually go on one of these flying programs, take a minute to reflect with yourself or maybe discuss with your family or your counselor, um, you know, what might be your personal goal for this experience? Because yes, you want to make sure this is a school you might be interested in, but a huge part of why we offer these programs is for you to resolve um, the questions that you might have or the concerns you might have. So, for example, if you're like, hey, this school seems really interesting, but it's very small and I don't know if I would be comfortable there. Or, um, you know, I never really, we're in engineering school, so if you're like, I never really thought of um, engineering for myself, but I'm kind of getting interested in the idea of it and I want to learn more about what engineering really is and, and if it might be for me start to think about, you know, by the time that fly-in is done, what do you hope that you will have learned that might help you um, as you're building your college list later on? Okay, awesome, thank you so much. So let's give a virtual round of applause to our panelists uh, and thank you to them and thank you to all of you all for joining us.